All right, everyone. Well, welcome to the Hemophilia Council of California and our first policy and advocacy webinar of 2021. This is the state of the state of healthcare in California, what you need to know. My name is Lynn Kinst. I'm the executive director of the Hemophilia Council of California, and I want to welcome you today to our webinar. We also have with us Terry Cowger-Hill, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Um, it will also be provide, helping provide an update on what is happening in our state capital. So just by way of introduction today, I uh, wanted to remind everyone of some topics that we discussed um, last year, actually, at our um, kickoff webinar of the year. Um, some goals that we have had are to continue to increase communication with all of our stakeholders within the bleeding disorders community. Um, and I believe that we've made progress with that goal this year. Um, we've increased the number of webinars, we've had some additional meetings with stakeholders, and we've really tried to um, make sure that we're both um, sharing updated information, but also, you know, um, keeping you informed and listening to the community to hear kind of what you have questions about and need to hear more about. Excuse me. Um, collaborate in sharing information related to state and uh, legislative and regulatory issues. Um, we're also working to uh, enhance the coordination among patients, foundations, HTCs, and other providers. Um, we're working to to collect stakeholder data to have a maximum um, advocacy impact. And specifically, really, what I mean by that is. One of the things that we have done this year in particular is when um, when folks contact us because they're having problems accessing medical treatment, whether that's a problem with CCS or GHBP or whether they're having an issue getting something approved or um, you know handled through say private insurance. Um, there's all different ways and shapes that those concerns come to our attention. Um, we have been tracking all of those cases, not, not necessarily so much by the individual patients, but what types of issues are coming to us so that we can see trends. One of the trends that we saw this year was that there was um, an, an unusual number of delays in GHPP renewals. And so what that told us was that, hey, something might be going on at the department that's causing more <laughs> delays than normal. Um, obviously we know COVID has been happening and that has created some challenges for workflow for most of us in our jobs. And so because we were able to observe that, that challenge, we were able to then address it with the department. And I think we were able to get some resolution and some progress on that issue. Um, so it's really helpful for folks to let us know when they're having these issues because we can then see where there's real trends happening um, and where people are having trouble accessing treatment or um, care. Um, accelerated community contribution when state issues arrive or information and data is requested. Um, one of the things that I'm excited about this year is we have a new platform that's going to make it easier for us to communicate with you when there is a legislative issue that we want you to talk to your legislators about. Um, and so that's going to make it easier for us to get that information out to you and provide a really easy platform for you then to be able to send an email or make a phone call to your legislator to be able to to share your opinion about, um, about that issue that's coming before them. And then finally, better understand compliance standards within the state to make sure that they provide the maximum benefit to the bleeding disorders community. So those are some priorities that we have um, for this year. So after a year like 2020, what is the outlook for 2021? Um, we all know that COVID-19 sort of turned our world upside down. It continues to strain our economy and our healthcare system, particularly in California and particularly in Southern California. Um, but with that, advocacy is more important than ever. And um, so we have continued our programs in our virtual format in order to make sure that we are um, staying, you know, keeping you informed and also working with legislative and um, regulatory branches to address any problems or concerns that our community faces. And we will 
continue to advocate to improve access to care and treatment options to advance the quality of life for people with bleeding disorders in 2021. Um, one of the issues, of course, that we've all been hearing a lot about is COVID-19. And although it's not the primary subject of today's uh, webinar, we did want to provide a few quick resources that to share with you um, because we've get, been getting a lot of questions specifically about texting and vaccines. So NHF has produced a couple of great resources um, about sort of an FAQ specifically about vaccines. Um, we are not here to give medical advice, um, but that NHF uh, frequently asks questions about the vaccine is really helpful. And, and it is going to specifically address some of the questions you might have as a person with a bleeding disorder considering a vaccine. And then of course, you're gonna wanna talk to your healthcare provider about any questions or concerns that you individually may have. Um, and then for those of you here in California, um, the state of California has the covid19.ca.gov website, which is really where they're compiling all of their COVID-19 related information. Um, so from that page, there is a page where you can go and you can go to the get tested portion of the site, which is going to link you to testing locations and sites. And then there is the vaccine section of that page um, that talks about the vaccinate all 58, which refers to the 58 counties in California. <laughs> Excuse me. So one of the things that you will want to understand is that while the state is providing a framework for like the order in which people will be eligible for the vaccine um, based upon um, various criteria. For example, I think most people have heard that the first tier has been healthcare workers who've been getting vaccinated. And now we're going to be moving in to the next segment um, fairly soon. In exactly how that's working out, is it being administered by uh, departments of health in each county? And so when you go to that covid19.ca.gov backslash vaccines website, one of the, it'll, it'll outline all of the state's sort of overarching um, criteria and um, protocols, but it will also link you to the county pages. So you can go and find your individual's county page related to vaccines through that site and get more information. I know that the, the next tier um, that everyone has been looking at going after healthcare workers and was going to be those over the age of 75. I did actually literally just as I was getting on to this webinar, um, see some healthcare reporters tweeting about some changes that the state was making to that and that um, that they are announcing that it's going to be opening up for 65 and over instead of 75 and over um, more quickly. So there should be more information, I'm assuming, posted at that vaccine website shortly with this new updated information. I checked it right before we got on the webinar and the, the new information was not posted yet. So I'm hoping that that will be up there soon. <clears throat> and um, just by way of reminder, not experts on the vaccine rollout by any means, but if you do have questions, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them or direct you to the appropriate resource page um, throughout the throughout the webinar or um, or at the end. So with that, I would like to introduce Terry Calger Hill. Um, I think she's a familiar face to most of you. Terry is the principal with Calger and Associates. She's a health policy expert and has been the longtime legislative advocate for the Hemophilia Council of California. So um, Terry, I'm gonna let you uh, give your welcome and then we'll, we'll roll to the next slide. Great. I'm glad to be here. I've, I'm actually in my 28th year with the Hemophilia Council of California, and I've had the pleasure of representing you in Sacramento and California for a long, long time. I primarily focus upon the state budget advocacy, 
whereby the programs that benefit our consumers, such as the California Children's Services Program for infants and children, and the Genetically Handicapped Persons Program for those 21 and over receive their funding. So I work a lot with the state budget process, as well as the legislative arena. Um, our last big statute that we secured was back in 2012, which was the standards of delivery of clotting factor in the home setting. And that statute still guides the state to this very day and is on the books and will be on the books for a long time coming, I imagine. So the governor has introduced his new state budget and the way the budget process works in California is that in January, per our California state constitution, our governor puts forth a spending plan and it's his proposed spending plan for the next fiscal year, which begins July 1st of each year and goes until June 30th. The proposal is put forth by the governor and then the legislature meets via the subcommittee process during the, the coming months. And hopefully by July 1st of each year, uh, we have a new state budget put into place. The constitutional deadline for the budget to be voted upon is also June 15th of each year. So that gives um, everyone in, in California that's working on the budget process a few weeks to kind of fine tune it before it hits the governor's desk. So this year, we have a $227 billion state budget proposal for the 2021-22 fiscal year that starts July 1st. The exciting thing this year is that more than half of our state budget, $126 billion, is earmarked for health care. There's also $4.4 billion set aside for the COVID-19 pandemic that Lynn was talking about. And in addition, there is 1.1 billion set aside for the new Cal AIM proposal, which is basically whole person care. And I'll get into the details of that um, in the coming slides. Really exciting from our perspective is the 94 million put in by the governor for telehealth, because during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in 2020, we moved to a lot of telehealth medicine in California. And the Hemophilia Council has as one of our top priorities this year to ensure that many of those um, programmatic um, items related to telehealth will continue um, not only in 2021, but into the future. So the exciting news is we have a budget surplus. It's allowing the governor and the legislature to do a little bit more than we normally would be able to do in the healthcare arena. And so the timing is really great. Will we be able to have enough funds in future years is unknown, but for this time period, it looks as if the 94 million for telehealth is being put forth and um, there's a lot of support and momentum behind that. So some of the more details of the, the budget that I just mentioned, the 4.4 billion set aside for the COVID-19 pandemic will include federal funds. So most of those federal funds have not yet been formally secured, but the governor's office has been working with the new incoming Biden-Harris administration and are hopeful and feeling pretty confident that we will receive um, much of the federal funds that we've requested. The money will be used for vaccine administration and response, as well as increased caseload in the Medi-Cal program. Because as many of you know, um, a lot of people lost their jobs during the pandemic and are now on the Medi-Cal program. The 94 million for telehealth will be used to make permanent and expand certain telehealth flexibilities that I mentioned in 2020 and will be put in place to improve access to providers and address healthcare disparities and inequities for certain key communities that have been negatively impacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, the, the slides and the resources page will be up on the website. Um, later this afternoon, and uh, we will get the video uh, edited and up in the next couple of weeks. And we really appreciate you joining us today. Hope that you found this helpful. And just say thank you again to our sponsors, um, to BioMarin and HF Healthcare for helping to make today's webinar possible.